Uh, tonight, we turn our focus to a former NBA player who became a bigger success after his retirement. Jonathan Bender is one of those rare guys who jumped from to the NBA from a high school. While injuries did cut his career short, it also gave him the inspiration for a revolutionary medical device. But let's start way back at the beginning, back in 1999, when Larry Bird said that Bender had more talent than anyone in the draft. In our conversation, I started off by asking him if it was a tough decision to turn pro. Easy decision. It's just, I'll flip that question. If you were trying to be a top anchor guy and you were in high school and they said, hey, here's your position, you can be top three. How could you say you no? Can, uh, uh, you know, it. you had to have confidence in yourself. You had to believe that you could make that leap. You saw those guys successfully making that leap before, so the path mm -hmm. was already laid out in front of you. Right, and I really didn't, you know, I, I really didn't pay attention to the guys too much who came before me. I would watch every now and again. I wasn't a, you know, a basketball head watching every game. I was always out in the parks playing. But when this opportunity came, I'm from a small town in Mississippi. I've never seen anybody do anything super great or, you know, outside of our town. So top five to me it was time to go I mean that validated who you were but by the way if it were me I, I would have crumbled under the pressure so I, I, if they would have put me in the spotlight at that yeah. age I, I can't imagine what it would be like for an 18 year old uh -huh. to come in there now we saw the success stories with obviously Colby but how do you think that those high school players jumping in the NBA yourself included impacted the league I think it really did I think it did in a positive way too because so many of us were successful. You look at Kobe Bryant, you look at LeBron James, you look at Garnett, a lot of the top names in the NBA are high school guys. Mm -hmm. So we really went in and represented in a, in, in a real manner. Yeah, the NBA changed the rule though. Mm -hmm. They made, they kind of did a little, a little bit of a correction, uh, if you will. Did they make the right decision? Or should high school players still be available <clears throat> to the NBA? Uh, I, I don't know if it was made in the favor of the player because one year, does that really make a, a big difference? Mm -hmm. And if you look at every other sport from baseball to soccer to tennis, I mean, guys come out of high school, guys come out, you know, at a younger age. Would there have been anything that could have convinced you to go? You had verbally committed to Mississippi State. Yeah. Anything convince you to go to college? No, I'd already made a decision, you know, after my 10th grade year that my goal was to make it to the NBA. Mm -hmm. That was my goal after 10th grade. So when the time arose and it was time for me to go, I went. That, that was my goal. All right, so here you are with the Pacers. Uh -huh. uh, Larry Bird is your head coach. Um, you didn't get a whole lot of playing minutes in that first year. Do you think that stunted your development? No, I think a lot of players, even if you're four years of college, they come out and you don't get a lot of playing time. You get groomed, you start to, you get time to grow, to be around these guys and learn how to play the game of basketball. So, it, you know, it was a learning uh, atmosphere and a learning experience for me. So it happens to most guys. You were with the Pacers during what was considered by many one of the ugliest moments in NBA history. The Detroit. malice at the Palace. Detroit. You were on the bench mm -hmm. uh, for that game. So you had a ringside seat for all of that action. Yeah, that was a scary moment. Was it? Yes. What was that like seeing all that? Uh, something that's very hard to describe. You know, when you, when everything usually happens on the floor. I'm used to guys getting the scuffles on the floor. But when you see, you know, things start happening in the stands and you see the reaction yeah. you know the reaction was the the part right because usually you look around and you see all these security guys and you feel safe when you got 20,000 people already rush trying to rush the floor at the same time and the security guys can't really hold people back mm -hmm. that's when you know you get a little nervous I mean that that night has been talked about ad nauseum uh -huh. over the past 10 years is there anything about that night that we don't know uh, Anything I, I that led to the blow up or? No, I mean, everybody saw what happened. Yeah. You know, the cup got thrown on, on Ron's face. Yeah, I think but on you his know chest what? Stephen Jackson looked like he had it, something in his head. It looked like he was about ready to throw fisticuffs no, I mean, early on. I mean, Steve is just a loyal guy. If he's behind you, he's behind you. He's going to go to war for you right. all out, right? Um, but I think Ron was at that tipping point. You know, he was at that tipping point, and that cup just tipped him, tipped him over. <laughs> he did. He did what the coaches told him to do: just go, sit down, don't interact with them. And, and at some point, I guess you know, the button was pushed. The button was pushed. At that point, then in your career, the knee injury mm -hmm. uh, happened for you, and it led to your retirement, which actually led to your second career. So let's talk about this breakthrough in medical science here with this uh, this development with the knee injury. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you know, as soon as I walked away from Indiana I was basically you know 
physically and mentally exhausted uh -huh. from coming back so many times and trying to get myself back into a, a place where I felt healthy enough to play. So after about two years of rehab, I walked away and uh, I always knew in my mind I was going to try to come back. But uh, about my fifth month out, uh, I started using, you know, my creative muscles to try to develop something that could help me along with my comeback. So I developed it. It was very simple. It took about 10 minutes. You know, really to draw it up. So what's the point of this, uh, um, this exercise, this revolutionary device? Well, it's more of a um, pressure relieving device. Put it like that. I call it uh, zero G technology. So um, if you think of a therapy pool um, that takes pressure off the joints, mm -hmm. it's exactly what this does. It's almost like putting on another set of hamstrings. It takes the pressure off the lower extremity uh, joints, the lower back, the hips, and the knees, and it redirects all that pressure to the muscle. That is a rehab movement. That's what people with joint pain and knee injuries, that's what they need their muscles to be engaged enough to be able to protect them from the weight of their upper body. We see that it's helping NBA players as well as, as some older people who have mm -hmm. knee injuries as well, right? Absolutely. With our, um, our Med Pro device, you know, that, it was designed for, you know, the age range from 15 to 90 of people who are coming out of surgery, uh, preventive, um, people who just have wear and tear on their, on their body. Of course, this year we're coming out with a version strictly for athletes and highly active people with joint pain. And by the way, you rehabbed yourself back yep. from your knee injury after retirement. You felt so strong after retirement that you came back and you came back with Donnie Walsh, mm -hmm. who was at the time with the New York Knicks. Right. And you played for one year, 24 games with the New York Knicks. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about the relationship you have with Donnie Walsh and how important it was for him to believe in you. Donnie Walsh was the one that believed in me from the start. You know, from trading Antonio Davis uh, to bring me to Indiana, you know, you had to have some strong belief. And to stick with me through those injuries and then to say, even when I left, if you ever decide to come back, make sure you call me. That's some deep faith. So um, to have that type of faith in me, you know, he was the first one I called when, when, when I decided to make my comeback. So your relationship with Donnie Walsh, I'm sure you're, you're still friends today then, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I spoke with him not too long ago. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, I'm sure, listen, it was, it's widely known that, that Donnie Walsh and James Dolan didn't exactly get along <laughs> very well. How, how bad was that friction between yeah, those guys? You know, I, didn't, I didn't keep up with it. I didn't keep up with it. I tried to focus on what I had to do on the court. I tried to focus on, you know, going out and proving to everybody that I could still play and focus on making a, you know, making a difference while I was on the team. So I didn't really focus on what was going on. I heard a little bit about him trying to be the controlling factor and mm -hmm. the decision maker as far as when it came down to players and whatnot, but I didn't really uh, dive into it too much. So. Well, what does a player think when the owner tries to put his hands and put his fingerprints on a team like that? Well, I mean, the players, I mean, you know, it's, it's his business, you know? He's it's the his, boss. It's, it's his business, you're the product. You know, I mean, Kellogg's, what would they think of Corn Flakes actually jumped up and spoke back to him? You're the product. I mean, you, you know, you do you your job. You put it in so colorful role. way. I really you appreciate it. play your role, you know. <laughs> appreciate Jonathan Bender joining us in studio. And by the way, his JBIT device has become so successful. It was acquired by International Sustainability Group, a green technology company. He now serves as the president of that health unit.